Hello and welcome to Property Matters. I'm Stephen Galpin and today we're going to be discussing politics in the world of development. Joining me to talk about this is somebody I can't think of anybody better qualified than, <laughs> than uh, John Howard, developer, mentor, author. Chairman of the, House of the Conservative Association, Ipswich, and, and now I'm president. Right, not biased, so, not biased at all. Not then. biased in the least. Oh, great stuff. Okay, John, we're going to get straight on with the conversation. And, and what I want to do is just understand government's role and what you think yep. is right and what's not right. And the first subject is that just lately the government has scrapped all these um, housing targets. So how are we going to judge what's needed and where is it needed? Well, they've had to scrap all the targets, basically, because the targets of 300,000, which is what they were talking about, mm. have never been met ever. Mm. The best they've done is 235,000 houses. This year it'll be less than 200. You've got the major house builders cutting back because they can't sell the houses. So, you know, uh, there's one particular house builder builds 15,000 houses a year uh, normally. This year they're building 9,000. That's a major problem for the government who are trying to push through uh, and force these local authorities to uh, build more, uh, to allow planning on more on more property, more houses. Mm, okay. And do you, do you think that's going to change under a Labour government if we get one? <laughs> well, um, hopefully we won't get a Labour government. That's the first thing, Stephen. I see you with a smile on your face. <laughs> right. uh, I'm totally apolitical. Of course you are, apolitical. Of course you are, apolitical and rightly so. Um, I would I would say that um, whoever's in government, a bit like the NHS, isn't it, really? Whoever's in government has got major problems. You know, it's one thing saying you're going to do it. It's another thing doing it. It's very, very hard to force local authorities to allow enough um, new homes to be built. But, but John, when I hear Rishi and uh, Jeremy come out and they're all dressed yes. up in their hard hats and Ivy's yes, jacket Ivy's, and, yeah. and we're, we're going to build. Well, who's we? Well, it's not them, is it? No. Uh, it, 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 the major house builders control 62% of the housing market in the UK, the new homes in the, new, in, the, in, in, in the UK. And the problem with that is that they're in control. Just like this year, they've just all decided they're going to build less because they can't sell them. So, you know, in the 1970s, small house builders, uh, and they were considered builders who built less than 250 houses a year controlled 71% of the housing market. Yeah. It's a massive difference. Sure. I mean, I know, I know here's a number of developers that are actually sort of um, putting schemes on ice, as it yeah, were, because absolutely. they're so frightened about the escalating costs of materials and labour that they just can't afford to risk. You know, you start building a half a billion pound skyscraper, you can't suddenly stop halfway because things have gone up, can you? So. I was on the train today, funnily enough, coming here with, I bumped into a friend of mine who's building 270 new homes, uh, and he started it two years ago, and his costs have gone up 30% during that time. It's amazing. Yeah, it's a major problem. Okay, um, all right, moving on. Um, what we've got is, quite often an argument between central government and local government about what should be given in yeah. terms of planning permission. Yes. Um, what I'd like to understand from you is how much influence do you think the central government should have over local authorities? I think it should have 100% control of what's being built because otherwise you won't get enough built. Because every local authority, I, when you go, when you put an application in, they are constantly trying to trying to stop it happening, in my view. Mm. The idea that uh, they, the government came up with saying, oh, if you put an application in, you know, the premise is you should get it, and, you know, you should get it, is just not true. And the government, the local, the local um, authorities uh, came out last year and said that 91% of all applications are approved. Mm. Now, I don't believe that at all. I think it's 91% of applications that they recommend approved. And that's very, very different. Very different. Yes. Very, very different. Yeah. And very, very misleading. Very misleading. The problem we have is that no one wants a load of houses built close to them. No. You know, transport's a problem. Highways is a problem. Schools is a problem. Everything like that. And it, the, the infrastructure cannot take it. No. Well, you see, that leads us on to the next thing, which is nimbyism, isn't <laughs> it? You know, not in my backyard. Yep. Now, now I, 
I hasten to, I don't know whether this is right or not, but th there are some commentators that say it's as often as not the conservative green belt areas that are the most guilty of this nimbyism. And say, not in my backyard. You can, you can go and build in the north of England. You can go and build wherever you like, but not here, thank you. Not in the green counties. Is that right? Well, when you consider that there's been more new homes built in, in the southern counties than anywhere else, I'm not sure it is right. The fact is that there's lots of space up north, but not enough people want to live there. I think they, the government needs to give people incentives to live up north because there's more space there. If we built on all the brownfield sites in the UK, these are sites that have been used for something else in the past, there'll be little reason to build on any green field, never mind green belts. Mm. Green belt came in in 1948. It was to protect areas of natural beauty. It, it also, unfortunately, um, uh, looks after areas that aren't. I mean, I was involved at Cambridge United. We we're building a new stadium and we were going to an area which was an old um, pit. And that was in green belt. Well, that's just bonkers. Mm. The yeah, only thing yeah. you can build in green belt is a park and ride. Right. You can tarmac it all, that's fine, well, the local authority can do that, but no one else can. Oh, that's amazing. And I mean, I think going on from NIMBYism, I mean, I, do you think again that central government should really put some restrictions on, on refusal for local authorities? In other words, the local authority should have a really cast iron reason for rejecting something, either a you know, really onerous sort of... Well, I think the problem we have is 50% of appeals are upheld, mm. 50%. And when you consider that um, a number of the appeals should never go to appeal, I, I suppose that, you know, that means, in other words, some of them have got no chance at all and shouldn't go. So probably they're probably agreeing 70% of genuine cases. Mm. Um, an appeals officer, I think, gets £460 for doing it. It's just not enough. You know, you, you, there, there's a massive backlog um, and it but just the, needs the, to be the, a the better, more professional system. The overall cost of an appeal is horrendous. Exactly, it? but it's not going to the appeal officer, that's for sure. No. Where's it going? Lawyers? Lawyers, yeah, but, uh, planning barristers, obviously, yeah. and people like that. It, the truth is, if you were a very big house builder, you can just about bulldoze, excuse the pun, quite a good mm. one, I thought. Mm. Bulldoze, you obviously don't think so. Bulldoze uh, your way through the planning system and get permission on really big sites yeah. because they've got lobbyists who lobby the government. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, for, for the smaller developer like ourselves, it's much harder, much, much harder to mm. do. Well, I have to say, I've told this story before, I think, on PTV, but I mean, I have a friend that's a, a planning barrister and I got refused some permission out in the country to do something. So, of course, I go to my friend and I say, can we appeal? And he does his usual lawyer thing, holds his hands together and says, well, yes, of course, if you yeah. can afford the fees. Yep. Um, but he came up with probably one of the best bits of advice I've ever had. And he said, have you thought about why they've turned your application down? And yeah, I said, well, advice. yeah. So he said, well, it's because they don't like what your architect's drawn. So I yeah. said, yeah, fair enough. So he said, well, he said, why don't you just go back to your architect and tell him to jolly well draw something that they do like? He said, it'll be an awful lot cheaper. And I mean, that was a stunning piece mm. of advice from totally. somebody very clever. Yeah. And mm. I think a lot of people would would do well to sort of listen to that because I think um, going in for the appeal process these days is, is hugely expensive. Well, it's six to 12 months of your life. And, to, and six, 12 months yeah. of your life, yeah. wondering whether you're going to yeah, be successful absolutely. or not. And of course, being successful or not means whether you've actually perhaps even wasted your money on the site. Mm. Well, you could have already bought could, it and all sorts. Could be catastrophic, yeah. couldn't it? Yeah. Okay. Well, look, just in the uh, finish off the first half of this uh, uh, programme, um, I also want to ask you something else which is going to affect volumes. And it's, do you think that the government really should intervene with taxpayers' money to help young people get on the housing ladder? <laughs> That's a very interesting one, because today, of course, um, I've heard that there's one or two building societies coming out with 100% mortgages again, mm. which is interesting. What a surprise. What a surprise. <laughs> and of course, there is a great argument to say that if they're, if they're paying more rent than they would on a mortgage, then perhaps they've got a point. Well, perhaps John, they've got a point. John, I, was, I, I go back to the original cause of this trouble in 2008, 2009, yeah. which was the American banks 
parceling up all these mortgages, yeah. getting anybody who could breathe to borrow some money yeah. to swell the portfolio, yeah. selling it and, yeah. and gone. And I've often said since, I don't know why we had the problem in this country because it wasn't our people no, having 100% mortgages no, that caused the problem. No, it wasn't. It, 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 it genuinely wasn't. And I still say that even if somebody has got very little or no equity mm. in, in, in a property, they don't buy it to give the keys back, do no. they? The first thing you know, anyone does or should do when they buy a property is get that mortgage paid every month. Yeah. What's left, they can do what they want with. Yeah. But getting that paid, and, and of course the help to buy is finished, mm. but there's talk now of it coming back, surprise, surprise, because the house builders have lobbied the government mm. and said, look, we're building far, far too few houses now because of the market, we need a boost. Mm. And that's what's going to happen, I expect. Okay, lovely. All right, well, that's the first half of the show over. So join me again after the break when I'll be discussing more about politics with John Howard. Hello and welcome back to Property Matters. I'm Stephen Galvin and I'm joined by John Howard and we're discussing the role of politics in development. So John, moving on to construction and what we can and can't build, do we think that construction sort of systems and ethics are going to change awfully in the next coming years? We can talk about modular construction. You and I would probably say prefabricated construction. We probably would. <laughs> um, so we're, we're t timber frame buildings are yeah. coming back, aren't they? Well, we? I mean, they were the big in the 80s, <laughs> yeah. about homes. Timber frame buildings, didn't yeah. they? That was the big thing, wasn't yes. it, in the eighties? Well, until you couldn't get a mortgage on one. Well, yeah, but it, oh. but they did improve them after a while. Okay, so what do we think? Well, I think the modular. I mean, everyone's banging on about modular, and and I have so many, mainly younger people, uh, come to speak to me at different events and say, "Oh, yeah, we're going to do modular, modular." I said, well, "Good luck with that." And they said, "Why is that?" I said, "Well, first you need a ten-year warranty, which they're now getting them more on, you know, building warranty. They're now getting those more." But I said also, they're still costing more than traditional bricks and mortar. And if you got the two, which one would you, which one's easy to sell still? And I would say it will change, I'm sure, Stephen. But at the moment, I would say traditional house, the way it's built, brick built house, is easy to sell, mortgage and mm -hmm. resell. And resell is also very important. Mm -hmm. If you look at the, t let me ask you a question, Stephen, if I may. How many of the top 10 house builders in the UK are building modular? Very few. I would say Very zero. Mm. One of the big boys um, has just um, invested uh, 60 odd million into a modular factory along with other investors in the UK. So that tells me they're going to put their toe in the water. Mm. But that's all they're doing. Yeah. Until you get the top 10 building modular homes, it won't take off. No. And I think, John, if we just go back to the uh, what should we say, the, the, the process yeah. in selling a new home. I'm not talking about apartments so much, I'm talking about yeah. individual homes. Yeah. And there's a developer just across the way there who's, who's really got it down to a T. They will, of course, use this business of getting to a sort of three-quarter stage of the construction, yeah. calling you up and saying, right, now, how do you want your kitchen? You know, do you want blue tiles? Yeah. Do you want red tiles, black tiles, whatever? Would you want this cooker, that cooker, yeah. or the other cooker? And of course, they use that as an incentive to yes. get the exchange. Yes. And that's an important, actually, and quite a critical part of the sales process. For, for, it for it is at the higher level. Yeah. At the lower level, it can cause all sorts of problems trying to do that. But at the higher level, I would agree with you. Mm. The argument is, of course, oh, we can we can build them much quicker. Mm. Well, you can, but one of the problems is funding. Because if you're building most of the property uh, house in a factory, it's portable. Sure. So who is going to lend money on something that could disappear? Mm. When you're building a house, traditionally, you've got foundations and everything else. Yeah. Now, Homes England, which is the government property bank, and it'll be very interesting to know if Labour do get in, whether they'll get rid of this bank. It's massive. The bank lends billions to housing associations, developers like me, all sorts of people. They do have a system where they will lend um, a portion of the money off-site, if you like. But it's a very complicated thing because, of course, normally you'd put a first charge on it, uh, yeah. the bank would, yeah. um, or they would. It's a bit hard to charge it's a sort of modular charge construction in a factory. It's going down, down the M1 yeah. somewhere. So, yeah. 
it's very difficult. So there's other problems with modular mm. that people perhaps don't think about enough. Mm. Well, it's a logistical problem, isn't it? Sure. I mean, and I mean, even if you're talking about sort of bathrooms that can be craned yeah. in, I mean, the, the actual transportation costs must be quite yeah. significant. Yeah. And, and again, the storage costs at yeah. wherever they're made. I mean, at the end be. of the day, they're still more expensive, even now, even after all the, you know, 30% increase in build costs, traditional build costs, they're still more expensive to build than the traditional house. And until that changes, mm. I don't think we'll, we'll really get motoring with modular. Is there, is, there a, is there a labor consideration with modular? I mean, do you need more people, less people, different skilled people? Yeah, you need less people. Because mm. housing, building a house is one of the few tra few things now where you still need a lot of physical mm. help. Mm. Um, the other thing, of course, is that the argument is, oh, well, it, it's an eco house and it's worth 20% more than any other house like it. Good luck with that mm. when you're talking to a valuer and a buyer, because yeah. you know what? Yeah. They're all very green until it comes to money. Well, it's, it's funny. I, I know we had a conversation not so long ago about where the lenders were actually allowing valuers the freedom to sort of up value to take into account green. No chance. It just doesn't It's happen, naivety. Does it? When yeah. someone says to me, oh, I'm going to get 20% more, John, will you joint venture with me? You'll do this or do that. Are you crackers? Yeah. It's bonkers. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, moving on again. Um, are we experiencing a cultural change with our youngsters not so desperate to own their own homes anymore? No. Next one. Next one. <laughs> well, I'm going to pull you back on that one. I mean, if we go into Europe, I mean, yes. they, they think we're absolutely potty wanting to buy yeah. our houses, well, don't they? they that's just... why we're not in Europe anymore. I suppose it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank God for that. Mind you, I don't... can you name me any good thing from there, Brexit? It's, it's all happening. It's all happening. Is it really? Keep the faith. Keep the faith. So. What I would say about young people, most young people, it's drilled into them in the UK from a very young age. Their parents hopefully own their own home. 64% of people in the UK own their own property. Something like 5 million people own more than one property. It's huge. It's huge. So, every, so most people see property in the UK as a long-term investment for their retirement as much as they do a house to live in. Now, that's perhaps unhealthy, but that's what they do. They look to buy a terrace, buy a semi, then buy a detached, then, then, then when they come to 60 odd or so, we're not, but most people are, downsizing, Stephen, yeah. into a smaller home, taking the cash out and giving the cash sometimes, obviously to the children to go and buy, do the same thing themselves. So, it, it, you know, we are unique. We've got thousands of lending institutions in the UK that will lend on a, on a residential property. Europe doesn't have that. We've got all the building societies. It's an amazing system that we have in the UK well, what, and unique to the rest of the world, just about. Well, it is, and I, but I suppose the one, you know, as a, ho as a house owner, you want it, but as an as, as economic principle, we shouldn't really be relying on house price inflation to make us wealthy. Well, we, we? you and I have done all right out of it over the well, years, possibly, so let's be honest. Possibly so. <laughs> possibly so but well, I'm you know, not, the I'm next not so generation, <laughs> are they going to do so well out of it? I'm not so sure. No, but I'm not. I'm not so sure. Uh, but, but people want to own their own home. They want that security. They want something to, you know, every, the, the other thing is, if you've got a, a repayment mortgage, by the way, don't have an interest only if you can help it, but repayment mortgage. If you can pay that mortgage off, you pay more than, than your mint on your mortgage, you, you, re, you reduce the 25-year mortgage or whatever you've got vastly. It comes down incredibly quickly if you can pay more than you're meant to. You know, you might come down from 25 years to 18 years or 17 years, but it's a huge difference to people. Um, but, but, it, but, it, but I still believe people in the UK want to own their own home if they can. Not everyone can, unfortunately, but that's no. the... But do you, think, do you think that, that motive is lessening? No. You don't? You I think? don't. And the reason I say that is 4% more people, young people, first-time buyers is up 4% this year. Mm. Who would have thought that? If they bought last year, they'd have got a much cheaper interest rate. Mm. Mm. Oh, well. Well, let's hope um, any government schemes do help the situation. Not I think they it. will. I yes. think they will. Okay, fine. Now, look, just to finish the programme off, um, I want to talk about buy to let. Oh yeah. Now, hasn't that finished now, buy to let? Is that like the help? Is that like help to buy? Well, no, not no? really. Um, what what we've got? I mean, if we go back to the late eighties, we had Margaret Thatcher bring in 
the the assured short term yes. tenancy, which brought a lot of people wanting to let their properties. Absolutely. Because for the first time in God knows how many yep. years, they knew they could get their property get back. Get have security. Yeah. Yep. So there was an element of security for the yes. tenant for a fixed period of time, and yep. there was an element of security for the landlord yep. knowing they can get their property yep. back. Now, two things have happened. One. The government now is discouraging the small, smaller <laughs> buy to let investors madness. by, by madness. rather penal sort of yep. taxation yep. changes. Um, also, just generally discouraging it, encouraging people to to be bigger and buy in limited companies, yes. have a multiple of properties, yep. and in fact go for the institutional yep. uh, landlord. And and on top of that. Um, they're sort of discouraging landlords coming back in or staying in by this no fault eviction Madness. business. So if once you're in a property, chances are you're going to be able to stay there unless there's some really extenuating circumstances. Yeah. So really the government are totally discouraging that end of the market. Mm. What do you think? Just let me check with you. It is a conservative government, is it, we have? Well, so you tell me. Because yeah. because if I see that Michael Gove again, and I do see him on occasions, not often at different events, I'm going to have to have a right go at him. Mm. Because this is all down to him, Housing Secretary, Michael Gove. Let me tell you what's going to happen. When you can't get someone out of your property, and you want to sell it, and you say, I'm going to sell it, I'm going to serve notice on the tenant. The tenant decides not to go. They don't have to go. They can stay forever. That property is worth 30% less. Sure than it would be if it was vacant because it's got a tenant in it. No one's cottoned onto that yet. But we, in the 80s, we were buying lots of blocks of flats at a 30% discount to open market value because you couldn't get the tenants out. No. we then slowly get them out and we'd sell them for the full money. Yeah. That's why I'm sitting here, basically. Yeah. Yeah. So I wish I was younger because I could take advantage of it all over again. Um, well, we can all wish. We can all <laughs> wish, can't we? So it, it, it's total, utter madness and if they want to reduce the housing stock in the UK, this is how to do it. Mm. it, it you know, the rental stock, it's madness. It makes no, sen no sense whatsoever to do it. And, but I can't see Labour overturning this. No, I can't. You know? OK, well, John, we've run out of time. So thank you very much it's a pleasure, for, as for always. coming in and uh, giving the benefit of your wisdom. Thank, thank you. you so much. Pleasure. Thank you for watching. I'm Stephen Galpin. Join me again next time on Property Matters. Thank you.